Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to a very wet Keswick and the start of Keswick Convention 2023. <laughs> it is such a joy to gather together once again. And whether you're with us here in the main tent or joining us via one of our relays or live streaming us, it's great to have you with us. I'm Anna, a Keswick trustee, and together with John C., a fellow trustee, we're going to be guiding you through our evening celebrations this week. I hope you've had a good journey. Who was here last year? Not quite <laughs> as hot as it was last year. I got absolutely soaked on the little journey from my car to the service station today. Who got soaked today? It's been a bit wet. You changed your clothes. Well, I'm glad you've made it. Hopefully, you found your accommodation. And I hope you're ready for what's going to be, I pray, a refreshing and encouraging week for many of us. Um, do keep in contact with us via the delights of social media. Our hashtag is KezCon23. Join the online chat. Share your experience of the convention. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we've got so many great things going on this week. And we'll tell you a bit more about them this evening as the program progresses. Uh, but the main reason we're here is to gather together as the people of God and bring him glory. So in a moment, we're going to sing praises to the Lord. But before we do, let me commit our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing each of us to this place. Whatever our day has looked like, whatever we have left behind, we pray that you would help us as we come before you now to leave all distractions aside, put aside all that hinders us, all that tempts us away from you, and join with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in lifting our voices to sing your praises. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to rejoice in our great God together. Please stand and join us. Let's sing. Before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, bought with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a Father who will Carried up the hill, he has walked this path before us, he is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice, and when you 
Father, we come to you tonight as your creatures in this world that you've made your creation. We acknowledge that we are weak and you are strong, that we are so limited and you are limitless. We are so often so foolish and you are all wise, all good, all known. This week we're here to praise you and to know you and to learn of you and to rejoice in your great love for us, shown in Christ. And so we dare to ask tonight that you might be gracious enough to meet us this week by your spirit, through your word, that you might revive us, that you might refresh us, transform us, discipline us if you need to discipline us. Father, we want to know you. And so we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Please take your seats. And I guess we come to a convention because we want to be a blessing to each other in many ways. It's just so lovely to sing together, isn't it? But also we want to be a blessing to Keswick Town and the wider surroundings. And so it's our privilege to welcome to the stage tonight the Mayor of Keswick, Steve Harwood. Last year, Steve. <laughs> Last year, Steve, you told us how many times you'd kind of got up and down the tree. How many times have you done it this year? 365. 365 times he's been up the local mountain. Thank you, Steve. That's amazing. Well, hello, everybody. We don't need a heat wave, do we like the one that's raving through Central Europe at the moment? This is the third time I've taken to this stage to welcome you to Keswick for the 148th anniversary of this unique convention in my second year as mayor. Our town is grateful that it remains buoyant despite the difficult economic situation which is, which is helped by you continuing to come. We do have the advantage of a spectacular setting in the heart of the Lake District, and I hope you will all have the opportunity to enjoy all the facilities the town has to offer. I understand the theme this year is human, which we can all relate to. I like to think this is an appreciation of how we all interact to one another in a spirit of compassion and willingness to make a positive contribution to the well-being of the community in which we live. I have chosen a public role as a town councillor following my retirement from practice as an architect. When I addressed this convention last year, I had just started to complete the challenge that we've just um, heard about to complete 365 different routes to the summit of our local mountain, Latrig, which looks over this venue. I didn't even know it was possible to find so many different ways before I started. But by using human ingenuity, and support from the townspeople, I was able to complete this challenge in May this year. The aim was to raise funds for less publicised local causes. One such project I was able to support was Tuesday's Tonic, which is a new initiative organised by our local Keswick Museum, providing a group meeting every two weeks for people living with dementia, plus their carers, and those experiencing loneliness. It provides an opportunity to get together for an afternoon of gentle creative activities, arts and crafts, music and storytelling, with lots of cake and laughter. It represents the best of being human and provides companionship for all those involved. It makes me proud to live in a community where people give of their time freely to help others. The renovation of the former Cumberland Pencil Mill is now largely complete and is a prominent feature in the town as the new spiritual home for the convention. It has been an extraordinary effort of human endeavour. I extend a warm welcome to you all and trust in the next few weeks this will all lift all your spirits. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the evening.
Thank you very much, Steve. And I'm sure we would all want to be good witnesses to the town of Keswick while we're here for this week. And here are a few ways in which we can uh, do that during our stay. Please do feel free to hang around on the site after the meetings. Uh, there's lots that the site has to offer, from the crepe van to the coffee shop. But uh, please remember that when you do choose to leave the site, to do so quietly and carefully, being mindful of those that live around us. There are many fun activities on offer locally, and you can use the Enjoy Keswick website to find uh, some of these local places to visit and attractions for the whole family where you can all shelter from the rain for an afternoon. So do support uh, the local Keswick during your stay. One other way of supporting the town of Keswick is by donating to a local food bank. There's a donation point both at Booths and at the co-op, both local to the site here and you can donate unopened tinned goods, dry goods and packet goods, as well as any cleaning products and toiletries you may have. Maybe you're like me and you come to a week like this and you order all the things you need and then at the end you've still got packets left over. Maybe it's the pasta or the baked beans, that's what it always is in my house. Anyway, why don't you take it along to Booze or the co-op and donate it there on your way home. Great idea, Vanna. Um, and please help us to be good stewards of God's creation by bringing um, your reusable water bottles and coffee cups. There are water stations located across the site so that you can refill your bottles. And you can get a discount on hot drinks if you bring your reusable cup. And maybe you're thinking, I don't have a reusable water bottle. Well, you can buy a very fetching <laughs> Keswick Ministries water bottle at base camp or reception, uh, and you'll not regret that at all. Also, please make the, the most of using um, the recycling bins around and take your litter home when you're out and about in the countryside. Brilliant. Well, we have a wonderful team of people who have volunteered their time to be on the welcome team this week. Give us a wave if you're on the welcome team. These are the guys in the high-vis jackets around you, um, and they're here to help and point you in the right direction. So do ask if you have any questions or problems, and they'll know who to ask if they don't know the answer. If you're new to convention this year, can you put up your hand if this is your first time at convention? Yeah, brilliant. It's wonderful to have welcome. you here with us. Welcome. Well, there are a couple of events this week to help you to get to know uh, the convention and to get to know one another. Um, tomorrow afternoon, from 2 till 3, there's a welcome reception in the pencil factory, the big building over there. It's room 1.01. Uh, and there's a link-up lunch on Monday in the Base Camp Cafe from 1.30 till 2.30 for anyone who'd like to come along and connect with others in similar positions. Uh, all those details are on the website if you haven't got it now, don't worry. And we want Keswick to be accessible to everyone. <coughs> and we have a few adjustments to help make that possible uh, with accessibility if you need to. As ever, there are braille and large print copies of all the song words. If you would like that, that would be helpful for you. Just ask one of the welcome team. They can bring that along. And we have the wonderful signers with us this week, which is great to have them. Yeah, give them a round of applause. They're doing a brilliant job. Great. Also, Count Everyone In is back on this week. <laughs> this is our program for adults with um, learning difficulties, and it will be on Monday to Friday, um, 11 to 12.30. There's also other things happening throughout the week, but it's great to have um, that on this week. Another thing to highlight, um, raise your hand if you're between the ripe old age of 19 and 24. There's a few of you here. There you go. <laughs> We've got um, a, a feast on for you this, this week. Um, you'll also be looking at the topic of human, um, thinking what it means that we're made by God and saved by God. Um, you've got morning gatherings, Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 11, and you can find out more about that on the website. Now, Matt's going to tell us what our kids and young people are doing this week. Matt, come join us. Hello, thanks so much, John T. Um, as John T said, my name's Matt, and I'm the Kids and Youth Ministry Leader here at Keswick, and it's an absolute joy uh, to be here. Uh, again, we're super excited, and I hope if you're aged between the ages of uh, three up to 18, um, you're super excited about getting stuck into God's Word, uh, about worshipping Him, about playing some games, and having some fun, and all the time learning more about our great Saviour, uh, the Lord Jesus. 
Uh, thankfully, I don't run the program alone. I have a wonderful team of volunteers, uh, and I thought it would be great to just introduce uh, two of them, Andy and Liam. So, Andy, do you want to introduce yourself, what your role is, and what can the young people look forward to this week at Keswick? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, my, my name's Andy. I'm married to Katie. We've got three young daughters in my day job. I'm about to become the minister of a church called St Anne's in Grantham in Lincolnshire, and here at uh, the Keswick Convention week one, I get the chance to head up the youth program. And in the youth program this week, just like you guys, we're going to be studying the book of 1 John in the mornings. We're really excited about really digging into that and seeing what it means to believe in Jesus, to uh, belong to his people and to become like him. And then in our evenings, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the person of Christ. We're going to explore who Jesus is and what difference that makes. We're going to see what it means to be truly human in light of Jesus, the God who became human, who uh, put on flesh for us. That sounds incredible. Liam, give us an overview. What can the kids get excited about for this week? Yeah, hi, my name's Liam. I, I come from Southampton. I'm a children's and youth uh, worker there, and I've left behind my wife and my two boys. Uh, me and a wonderful team who are around somewhere. Give us a big cheer, are they? Yeah, over there. Great. Uh, we are also uh, going to be in the book of 1 John, so just as you are here in the main tent in the mornings um, with Sam Aubrey and 1 John, we'll be uh, teaching 1 John uh, to the 3s to 11s. We're really excited. We're going to be looking in particular about what the book has to teach us about what it means to be a child of God. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, open that book up and to get, to get that taught and to be working at that with the, with the children. And then in the evenings for our 8 to 11s as well, uh, we kick off tomorrow night. We're going to be looking at Jesus as well. We're going to be working our way through um, the I Am statements in John's Gospel and seeing the wonderful offer of life uh, that Jesus offers us, as well as, of course, having lots of fun along the way too. Great. Thanks so much, guys. Please, please, please do be praying for, our, um, for Andy and Liam and the rest of their teams uh, as we open up God's Word with the children and young people. Well, we're super excited. These guys uh, are super excited as well. Uh, one thing that does need to happen before uh, we start our children's and uh, our youth groups um, is every person, young person, needs to collect um, a wristband. And wristband collection is going to happen tomorrow before and after uh, the all-age service. So we can collect a wristband from 9.45 a.m. Uh, till 10.15, and then after the all-age service from 11.45 uh, until 12.15 p.m., the wristbands can be collected from the venue that your child is going to attend. Uh, you'll see a, a, lift is, uh, a list of venues on the screen, but these can also be found uh, throughout the site on the uh, billboards that you will see up. Uh, but if you're still a bit lost and confused, uh, just go to reception and they will uh, love to help you um, out as well. So please do be praying for us. And I'm going to hand over to Karen, who's going to come and introduce uh, all about Basecamp for us. Karen. Thank you. Hello, my name is Karen, and I'm here on behalf of All Nations to run Base Camp Venue, which is just to your right. I don't know how this year has been for you, whether you're feeling really fired up and motivated, or if you're landing here with a heavy sigh and a heavy heart. We've been praying for you that your time here will refresh you, will re-energize you, will resource you for whatever you have to face when you leave sunny Keswick. If you'd like to be inspired and hear more about how God is at work in the UK and beyond, then head over to the amazing mission exhibition to join in at what God is doing, whether that's praying or giving or going or encouraging. Or maybe you want to be resourced with books and gifts to encourage people when you're at home. And Jonathan from 10 of those will be able to tell you more about what's on offer. If you're looking for space to process and digest or have a coffee with a friend, then Carita events have the most fantastic coffee. And this year they're serving smoothies and cold drinks. I'm not quite sure the weather's brilliant for that today, but we'll be praying for good weather. <laughs> Basecamp is here to inspire and resource you for the next 51 weeks of the year. So, what are you going to leave Keswick with this year? Thank you. Over to Steve to talk about prayer. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Praying. 
we would love to pray with you. My name is Steve James, and I lead the prayer team. Why pray with someone? Well, what you know is absolutely right. What you do is always the right thing. But the way you are may be all wrong inside. Need to pray about it. Need to bring it to prayer. So, after each main meeting, that is in the morning, and then the evening meeting, there will be a wonderful team. They are right over there somewhere, and they will pray with you if you gather in that corner about anything that concerns you. Don't leave without praying with somebody about something. Don't carry it home. Now, if you're in full-time Christian ministry and you want prayer, you can make an appointment at the reception over there. We can have a longer time of prayer, and those times are really special. So uh, do make appointments, if you will, Monday to Friday. Then finally, you need to get up in the morning. What's the best way to get up in the morning? To come to the morning prayer meeting. It's the best meeting of the day. No, it's the first meeting of the day. And it's at 8.45 to 9.15 over in the packing hall over there. We'd love to see you. So pray. Pray with somebody. And now, the notice you have all been waiting for. Books. Evening, everybody. Uh, it's so good to be back, isn't it? My name's Jonathan. I'm uh, part of the team that runs the, the bookstore through there in Base Camp. We're part of the 10 of those team. And if you've never been to the Keswick Convention before, um, let me say right off uh, from the start, we are passionate about helping you get books that will point you to the Lord Jesus, that as they do that can totally change your, your life. We want you to get good stuff that holds the Bible. And so everything we sell has been handpicked deliberately because we've, we've road tested it. We know it points to Jesus. We know it holds the Bible. And then we discount everything so that more copies can go out. So don't just think about yourself, but others that you might be getting books for and passing them on. And then uh, with the, the, the money that's generated, some of it supports the Keswick Convention, but then other ministries uh, around the world. So uh, as you're shopping, you're tithing, and then as, uh, as books go out, we want to support those who otherwise couldn't afford them. So uh, as you shop, you can, uh, you can remember that. Um, now, there's a massive selection. And as I say, they're carefully picked, but it, it can be hard to know, well, what do you go for? And so this year, what we've done is we've put together a collection of four books that if you're really not sure what to buy, that's the thing to buy, okay? And in the pack, you get, there's four books in here, you get a biography, uh, it's called To a Different Drum, and I have to say, I read a lot of biography. This is the best autobiography I've read in the last 10 years, okay? I can't give you a higher recommendation than that. It is brilliant, I'll tell you more about it during the week. There's also a new book by Ros Clark called Human, which is on the theme of, uh, of the convention this year. Very helpful book that will give you a great foundation to, to uh, biblical understanding of, of humanity, what it is to be human, and how that impacts our day-to-day -day life. Then there's a book by Paul Mallard, An Identity to Die For, which looks at how the gospel changes our identity, and then again, how that uh, impacts how we live out. And then one of the Keswick Devotions from Elizabeth McCoy, really good series there, undated devotions that will help you get stuck into God's Word. This should be 40 quid, we're going to do it for 20, with the idea that it, it hopefully isn't a hindrance in terms of price, and if you're not sure what to buy, the pack is the one to get. So come through, see us in, in, in base camp. we'll be with you all week, we'll be making recommendations, but get something good that will point you to Jesus and we'll be praying. It will have a massive impact on your life but also the lives that you may be able to pass them on to. And who knows what God could do through the ministry of the books this week. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Well, one of the reasons that Keswick Convention is such a fantastic event is that because there is no charge to attend. We are all one in Christ Jesus, and that's the vision of the convention. And we want to welcome everybody and for everyone to hear the word of the Lord, to be blessed by it, so that they can love and live for Christ in his world. Well, for almost 150 years, this has been made possible through the generosity of supporters, like you and me, who can both donate uh, while we're at the convention or online and throughout the year. 
It means that those who can't afford to give what it costs to run don't have to and can still attend and enjoy this blessing. It's a particular blessing for those with young families or who serve on the mission field globally and others who wouldn't um, otherwise be able to join in an event like this. So I want to ask for you to prayerfully consider what you can give, both if you're attending here, if you're in person, or if you're watching online. Please consider prayerfully what you can give. And so we're, we're massively thankful for those who've given in the past to make Keswick Convention happen. But as you can imagine, um, this year our kind of annual costs and costs to run the convention have gone up somewhat. And um, we estimate that this year, to run the convention, um, the cost per person, per adult, per week is about £135. Um, so if you'd like to give to the work that God's doing um, amongst us, um, there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, throughout the week, you can go to our donation stations, which are in the um, convention reception next to the packing hall, in the pencil fact factory reception, and at base camp. And there you can do contactless donation, you can set up regular giving, giving if you want, or you can fill out a, a giving form. But do you prayerfully consider what you can give to the ministry. Thanks so much. Well, our next song speaks of the hope we can have in Jesus. No matter how we come before God tonight, whether we are laboring on in weakness or rejoicing in all that God has done, it's not I who achieves and accomplishes anything but Christ living in me. So we can hold on to that hope that he has given to us. Let's sing. Please join us. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see.
ça fait tout. Well, in a moment, Jeremy McCoy, who is the chair of Keswick Ministries Trustees and pastor at Deeside Church in Aberdeen, will be speaking to us on the theme of image bearers from our passage from Genesis 1, which Anne Zaki is going to read for us. It's delightful to have Anne with us. She's going to be delivering a seminar series this week on Back to Basics. But before all of that, let me pray for us as we prepare to receive God's word. Lord God, your word is living and breathing with power to create, power to save, and power to heal. Help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God's word comes to us today from Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 to 31. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 to 31. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is God's word. Great, well it's so lovely to see this place packed here tonight. Uh, when I was walking here in the pouring rain, I thought you might all stay at home and maybe watch it on TV or something like that, but uh, it is lovely to have this place so full. If this is your first experience of the Keswick Convention, and I know for some of you it is, you are so welcome here. And uh, obviously you're gonna be hearing a lot of Bible teaching this week, um, so I want to um, really speak about what Bible teaching is meant to do in all of our lives. And over here, we have kind of carefully chosen three words to talk us through what Bible teaching is meant to do. Firstly, it's hearing. We're here to hear God's word tonight, um, not just intellectually, not just to learn about Bible content, but we wanted to change our lives so that we are becoming, becoming like Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So really, we haven't heard unless we are becoming like Christ. That's what God by His Spirit wants to do. And then after becoming like Christ, we want to serve God's mission. Wherever you are, maybe your home, your street, your local church, maybe God will call you this week to leave these shores and be a missionary abroad. I don't know. But be ready to serve God's mission wherever you are. That's how we'll know that we've heard God's word. We're becoming like God's son and we're serving God's mission. Now, please have your Bibles open. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, um, the whole title for these three weeks is called Human, 
and it's one of the most controversial topics, but one of the most important topics for us to look at. And uh, our passage th today is, is really um, about as controversial as it gets. So let's hear God's word with that in mind. Now, there is a, a great battle raging today. It's not the war in Ukraine or any other physical conflict. It's a war of ideologies. And at stake in this war of ideologies is the most basic issue of identity. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? What does it mean to be a human being? These are the most basic issues of life. And if we get the answers wrong, the whole trajectory of our lives goes askew. And the battle today is especially over whether I can create my own identity or whether there is a God who has created my identity for me. William Ernest Henley wrote his famous poem Invictus. He wrote, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that is the notion that dominates our culture tonight. But that notion flies in the face of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 leaves us in no doubt that we are creations of an all-powerful God. And this famous Genesis creation account does not begin with the question, who am I? Genesis 1 begins with the question, who is God? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the uncreated creator of all things. He speaks the entire universe into being, the sun, moon, and stars, the land and seas, the birds in the air and the fish in the sea. The Bible starts with who God is. And we can only understand who we are when we find our place in the creation story. If we leave God out of the picture, we simply won't be able to answer these most basic questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Instead, we will try to forge our own identity, which leads to the confusion and the chaos, I believe, that our culture is experiencing today. If we want to understand what it means to be human, we need to look at the maker's instructions. And Genesis 1 teaches us three core truths about who God made us to be. Firstly, it teaches us God created us with dignity. He created us with dignity. That's verses 26 and 27 of Genesis 1. The creation of mankind is treated differently to the rest of creation. It happens on the sixth day, the crescendo day that everything has been building up to. You'll notice when the animals are created, we read in verse 24, let the earth produce living creatures. It's in the third person, as every other element of creation is. But God takes a more personal approach for the creation of mankind. It's in the first person. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So there is a deliberation in the heavenly council before creating men and women. The words are strangely in the plural, let us make man in our image. And these are probably the earliest reference in Scripture to the Trinity. We have already seen the Spirit hovering over the waters in verse 2. And of course, John's gospel tells us that Christ is the Word of God. Nothing was made without Him. So every time it says in Genesis 1, and God said, that is Christ going to work. Each member of the Trinity is involved in Genesis 1. And God consulted within His blessed Trinity before creating mankind in His image. You notice that phrase, in His image, it's used three times in two verses. Verse 27 will say, so God created mankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. 
Now, a lot of ink has been spilt on this phrase, in God's image. What does it mean? Well, it seems to suggest all the ways that we are set apart from the animal kingdom. So, our intellect, our speech, our creativity are surely part of it. While chimpanzees tonight are trying to survive in what's left of the rainforests, humanity has sent rockets to the moon. Humanity has mapped the human genome and set out great manifestos like the statute of human rights. As humans, we write poetry, we create works of art, we search for meaning and purpose, for justice and for peace instinctively. We are not pure creatures of instinct like the animal kingdom. We are spiritual beings who were made for a higher purpose. This is how the American pastor Kent Hughes puts it. He says, though you could travel a hundred times the speed of light, past countless yellow-orange stars, swoop down to the fiery glow located a few hundred light years below the plain of the Milky Way, Though you could witness a star's birth, in all your stellar journeys, you would never see anything equal to the birth of a human being. For a tiny baby girl or boy is the apex of God's creation. That child is created in the image of God. And when the stars of the universe fade away, that soul shall still live. Brothers and sisters, what dignity we have been crowned with as human beings. And it's so important that we protect the dignity of every human being from the womb to the tomb. I remember Richard Dawkins plucking a worm from the dirt on a Channel 4 science program and rejoicing over how much we as humans had in common with worms. He was looking at just percentages of DNA and so on. Our culture has diminished humanity to being just another animal with a slightly larger brain. But to claim that is actually to diminish God's in whose image we are made. Psalm 8 says, you made mankind a little lower than the angels. That is our place in the created order. Lower than the angels, above the animal kingdom. But even that phrase, lower than the angels, has a huge caveat. Jesus Christ did not become an angel to die for angels. He became a man to die for men and women. And that the Creator Himself should take on human flesh propels the dignity of mankind into the stratosphere. And as Christians today, we are being remade now into the likeness of the Son of God. Romans 8 says this is God's whole plan for us. God's goal for us is to conform us into the image, into the likeness of His own Son. And He will complete that good work that He has begun in us. 1 John 3 says, when we see Christ, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. What a glorious prospect. The early church father Athanasius said, Christ became what we are, so that He could make us what He is. And that is God's ultimate vision for the human race. We are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. This is the dignity that we have been given as human beings. And it makes every human being on this planet infinitely precious. From the baby in the womb to the child living in the squalor of a South American flavella, to the brother or sister with Down syndrome who gives you a big hug when you go into church on Sunday morning. From the moment of human conception, an eternal soul is brought into existence, a soul with the unique ability to be in relationship with his or her creator. Astonishing. The Cambridge scientist Sir John Polkenhorne said, man looks through a telescope at the wonders of the universe. 
without realizing that the person looking through the telescope is more wonderful than the whole of the universe put together. Brothers and sisters, is that how we value the people all around us? If we have this Genesis 1 vision for humanity beating in our hearts, we will care for the poor. We will do everything in our power to lift people out of poverty. We will make our voices heard to defend the millions of babies who are being sacrificed in the womb for the sake of expediency. We will love the people in our church, especially the awkward ones, because they were made in God's image They have been redeemed by the blood of God's Son, and they will partake in eternal glory with us. Of course, the most controversial part of this verse in our day is that God made mankind male and female. Now, I could have preached this five or ten years ago, and it wouldn't have been nearly as controversial as it is today. But verse 27 clearly says this, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. So part of our dignity as human beings is the beauty of maleness and femaleness, two definite and distinct biological sexes presented plainly on the first page of the Bible, so it's really important. It's interesting that the animals aren't presented as male and female, even though biologically they are male and female. But there is an emphasis here on the maleness and femaleness of humanity as the first thing that is said about humanity, because it matters so very much. Genesis shows that men and women are equal in dignity. They are co-heirs of eternal life. But if we try and flatten out maleness and femaleness and say there is no difference between men and women, then we lose a key part of the image of God. Our society today presents us with kind of two conflicting images. One is that there is no difference between the sexes. And the other is that gender is fluid. It's a continuum. Our culture thrives on gender uncertainty today. We can be whoever we want to be. Now, of course, it's important to show compassion to those who struggle with gender dysphoria and to deal with them gently. Gender dysphoria and the mental health struggles that so often accompany it is a real issue. We need to be compassionate as Christians. But God's word is clear. We do not invent our own identity. It is given to us by the God who made us. And any gender uncertainty we have, which is a very real thing, is due to the fall and it needs to be redeemed along with every aspect of our humanity. I mean, for myself tonight, as a heterosexual male, my sexuality is affected by the fall. I need to watch the images that I look at, I need to be faithful to my wife, I need to guard my own lusts because I am a fallen being sexually. The fall has affected all of us in our sexuality. We can only understand our humanity through the lens of God's Word. And as Christians, we can be confident and full of hope in this identity that God has given us as human beings. Our world today, it seems more than ever, is struggling for meaning and significance, and we offer the ultimate message of hope that God made us in His image, and He has invested us with dignity. And as Christians, we have a better story to tell about human sexuality than the world does. Glenn Harrison, whose lectures were phenomenal last year on this very issue, Glenn Harrison said, it's time to recover our confidence that the Christian vision for sex, marriage, and family also conveys societal and relational goods 
that can bring blessing and flourishing to all. If we want to understand who we are as human beings, we need to follow the Maker's instructions. Firstly, Genesis 1 tells us He created us with dignity. Secondly, it tells us He gave us authority. God gave us authority as human beings. That's verses 28 to 30. Being made in the image of God in the context here primarily refers to the authority God has given us over creation. So, verse 26 says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky. And this theme of authority continues in verse 28. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, this verb subdue is fascinating. It's used elsewhere to talk about bringing another nation under subjection. And the idea is that mankind is allowed to explore and uncover the natural resources of the planet. And notice here, it's quite subtle in verses 29 and 30. In verse 30, the animals are given plants to eat. But in verse 29, humans are given seed-bearing fruit and plants. And the idea there is that God doesn't just give food to human beings, He gives the seeds that enable us to cultivate and develop farming and be creative and use technology and produce crops for the blessing of the whole planet. God gave us authority over the earth to exploit the earth's resources so that we could flourish. Now, of course, this command to subdue the earth is not a mandate to treat the world any old way we want. We're here to rule over the earth as God's image bearers, so it's in line with His character as good stewards of this beautiful blue planet that He has entrusted to us. And I think there are two unhealthy extremes that we can fall into as we think about looking after the planet. The first is to say that ecology really has nothing to do with me. I think that's probably the view I was brought up with. After all, God is going to destroy this planet one day, and He's going to usher in a new creation. Why bother looking after this? It's got a sell-by date. Absolutely not, says Genesis 1. God appointed us to be caretakers over this planet in His name. And turning a blind eye to ecology is one unhealthy extreme. So, watch very carefully with the coffee cups you have this week, which bin you put them in. It's important. You're an image bearer. Look after the planet. Now, the other unhealthy extreme is to turn environmentalism into a religion, a religion that seems to trump the gospel. However important it is to be a good steward of the planet, and it is very important It is also a fallen planet that needs redeeming. It is not Mother Earth. That whole idea of Mother Earth goes back to pre-Christian paganism. The Earth is the generous creation of a God who sent His Son to redeem it. And He will bring this current creation to an end, and He will usher in a glorious new creation. And that is the main message we have to preach. We must not sidetrack the gospel for the more popular message of save the planet. Everybody will love us when we're saying save the planet. But when John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, he's not talking about the planet. He's talking about lost people, people who are lost in sin and will perish if they don't believe the gospel and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior regardless of what will happen to our ecosystem. And in fact, Romans 8 says the whole of creation is waiting for its redemption. It's waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. So, let's play our part in caring for the creation that God has given us, but let's also recognize that this creation needs redeeming as a first priority. And of course, this idea of of subduing the earth relates actually to how we think every day about our workplace. 
When you go back home, recognize that your everyday work is valuable. You are subduing the earth in your own way. You are God's image bearer, invested with skills and creativity to use for God's glory. You do that at work every day. You'll remember how Daniel was honored for the role that he played as administrator in Babylon. And in fact, Jeremiah told the exiles going to Babylon, he told them to pray for the prosperity of the city. So you pray for the prosperity of your city, wherever you are, wherever you're working, and be part of that prosperity. We have a glorious vision for work given to us by Genesis 1. Christians should be the most satisfied, the most fruitful employees of all, because we're not ultimately working for a human boss. We're working for the Lord. Our work is worship. And as Mark Green so beautifully put it, God didn't make Adam a priest. He made him a gardener. Your daily work matters. You are fulfilling God's creation mandate. We have been given authority over creation, says Genesis 1. One part of that authority, according to verse 28, is subduing the earth. Another part of that authority is filling the earth. Verse 28 says, be fruitful and increase in number. And I think this is saying more than just make sure you have lots of children. This filling the earth, we've got to see through the lens of the entire Bible. This is a command to fill the earth with people who know God. This was a command given originally to Adam and Eve who were in daily fellowship with God. This is a mission mandate, ultimately, that gained further momentum after the coming of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But you don't have to wait to the New Testament to hear the call to mission. Genesis 1 is the first mission mandate. Fill the earth with people who know God. And Habakkuk takes up this theme when he says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so when Jesus says in Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, he is playing off the mission mandate of Genesis 1 and Habakkuk and multiple prophecies in Isaiah of filling the whole world with people who know God. Now this mission mandate for you and me very practically begins at home with how we prepare our children and our grandchildren to know the Lord. Yes, we want them to know maths and English, but the key passion of Christian parents is for our kids to know the Lord and then be sent from our homes as disciple-making disciples. Pray that about your children right now, even the children not yet born. Lord, make my children, my grandchildren, disciple-making disciples. And then we think and we pray and we strategize to reach our friends with the gospel, to reach our street, to encourage evangelism in our local church. And I pray for some of us, we will receive a specific call to leave our country, as of course Abraham does as early as Genesis 12, to leave our country, to take the message of Jesus to another country where people have not heard of him. Romans 10 says, how shall they call on the one they have not heard, and how shall they hear unless we preach, and how shall we preach if we are never sent? The Keswick Convention has been renowned for 148 years for global mission, reaching people for Jesus who have never had the chance to hear the gospel. I hope we never lose that passion in Keswick because it's being lost from local church life all across the UK today to send out missionaries who will follow in the footsteps of Hudson Taylor and Amy Carmichael and Wadkin Roberts, the Welshman who brought the gospel to Manipur in North India back in in 1910. And he saw Manipur go from zero Christians to 90% Christian within a generation. Let's not just read biographies about these missionary greats who were actually very ordinary people called by an extraordinary God. Let's write a new story today of men and women willing to leave these shores to carry the gospel across the globe and fulfill the mandate from the very first page of Scripture 
to fill the earth with worshipers of God, with people who know God. If we're going to understand what it means to be human, we need to listen to the Maker's instructions. Genesis 1 says, God created us with dignity. He gave us authority, authority to rule over the planet, and authority to fill it with worshipers. And thirdly, says Genesis 1, He destined us for glory. That's from verse 31 of the passage. He destined us for glory. Verse 31 of Genesis 1 is the culmination, not just of day six, where God creates mankind and the animals. It's the culmination of the whole week of creation, including land and sea, oceans and stars, dolphins and eagles. Verse 31 says, and God saw all that He had made, and it was very good. Genesis 1 is less a science textbook than it is a hymn of praise to a majestic and glorious Creator. And I promise you there are few better spots in the world than Keswick to appreciate the wonders He has made, at least when it stops raining. Creation was very good when God made it. And even though this creation has been marred by the fall, you can still perceive so much of its original glory. And the God who gave us this beautiful creation that has been marred by human sin so much, He has promised an even better one to come. I love that hymn by Timothy Dudley Smith. It has the words in it, darkness defeated and Eden restored. Now, I know what Timothy Dudley Smith means by that, but in the new creation, Eden will not be restored. Because no matter how beautiful the Garden of Eden was, sin could enter. A snake could slither in and deceive. Danger lurked. But the descriptions we have of the new heavens and the new earth, which Isaiah and Revelation give us, assure us that no sin will ever enter into this glorious new creation. Before Eve ever took the fruit from the tree, God had already planned to send His Son across the stars to come and die, to absorb sin's power in His own body, and then to rise again to usher in resurrection life. A whole new creation project began when the tomb opened on the third day. And that resurrection life has the power to renew the entire cosmos and to banish sin forever. So if we are in awe at the beauty of the lakes and the mountains of Cumbria, and we should be in awe, I hope you get a chance to be in awe this week, just remember, the best is yet to be. The glories of this current universe, they are just a taster of the new world that He is preparing for us. Every lawn today has a weed. Every ocean has pollution and every man is destined to die. Imagine what the cosmos will be like when all of those elements of decay are removed, when there are no more weeds, when there's no more pollution, where there is no more decay and death, all taken away. That won't be Eden restored. That will be the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven like a bride prepared for her husband. Robes will be white as snow. The waters will be sparkling blue. Tears will be wiped from our eyes, and every dark night of the soul will be dispelled forever, and we will live in an eternal new dawn. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize. We are not in the land of the living, heading to the land of the dying. We are in the land of the dying, heading to the land of the living. God destined us for glory. And when glory finally comes, the phrase, it was very good, in Genesis 1.31, won't quite capture it. 
like the wine that Jesus prepared at the end of the wedding feast in Cana. Jesus is leaving the best to last. The Christ who became human for you, who died for you and rose again for you and lives for you today at the Father's right hand, that Son of God is coming back to take you home. And at that moment, you will be more human than you have ever been. You will be everything that God ever intended you to be as you take on the image of the Son of God Himself. If you want to understand what it means to be human, you need to follow the Maker's instructions. He created us with dignity. He has given us authority. And He has destined us for glory. If the world was very good when He first made it, just imagine what it's going to be like when He remakes it. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen. Let's just take a moment of quiet and think about the word that we have heard tonight. And after this moment of quiet, I'll pray for us and then we'll sing our closing song. Heavenly Father, thank you for how beautiful you made this creation to be. And despite the fall, we can still see so many glimpses of its beauty. Father, thank you for what and who you made us to be. Made in your image, male and female. Father, thank you for how you made us. And I pray that even in this broken world where we all share in its brokenness in so many ways, thank you for this promise that there will be a glorious new creation, that Jesus has carried all of our brokenness, whether it's sexual brokenness or brokenness in all kinds of ways. Thank you that Jesus has carried our brokenness in His body on the tree. Thank you that He has dealt with every aspect of the fall. And thank you that when he rose from the dead on the third day, a power was unleashed that will renew this entire creation. Father, we long for that day. And as we wait for that day, help us to play our part in being conformed to the image of your Son. Help us to walk with you. Help us to talk with you as Adam and Eve did so easily in the Garden of Eden. Father, help us to be people of your delight. Restore to us a biblical vision of humanity. And thank you for the day when the character and glory of Christ will be stamped all over our lives. Thank you for Him, the model of a new humanity. And thank you that we are being remade to be like Him. Continue that process within us, we pray. And help us to be true worshipers as we go. Speak your word to our hearts, Father and give us a renewed vision of who you made us to be. We pray this for Jesus' eternal glory. Amen. Amen. Oh, how we long to see our Savior face to face for that day when our hearts are perfected and we are free from our sin. Let's stand and sing together.
in mind as we leave the tent this evening. Uh, for details of local church services going on throughout Keswick tomorrow morning, do visit the website or see the convention program boards as you hurry out under your umbrellas. If you'd prefer, there will be an all-age service here in the main tent tomorrow morning at 10.30 and that will also be relayed across to the base camp if you'd prefer to watch it there. The website is the place to go for all information about the program, if you've missed anything uh, for this week, or you can live stream there or catch up on anything that you haven't managed to get to. Very handy. And as is the case every night, the prayer space and spare area is over there. Um, do make the most of that. The prayer team are waiting and willing to pray with you over anything you want to pray about. But let me just end our time together with a prayer now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we've seen tonight in your word. Thank you for the value, the eternal dignity, the privilege of being made in your image and remade in your image. Thank you for what we've heard, that we are kings and queens of creation, destined for a new creation. As we leave tonight, Father, we pray that we wouldn't leave those truths. They would shape how we live our lives, how we see those around us and our hope for the world to come. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming this evening.
Have a safe journey home and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night.